Rob Jaffick. Uh, Rob is with Boomerang Capital. Rob is going to be talking um, about hard money lending. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of registrations uh, for this session. Um, and I want to turn it over to, to Rob. Rob, are you on the line with us? I am indeed. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, as far as the deck goes, as far as our slide goes, we are slight, we're a little bit lighter on slides than some of the others. We will uh, work through and then just a couple other points. I've got David with me, head of lending. Uh, he um, can provide a little bit more uh, deep in the weeds view as, to far, as far as what we do and what we're seeing. Um, and then as far as Q&A goes, if you just type those in, we'll get to those uh, maybe as we're going through the presentation. If not, we'll get to them uh, in the uh, Q&A portion. If we don't get them to the Q&A portion, we'll follow up with you indirectly. So go ahead and hit next slide for me. And you can skip, skip through the executive summary too. So um, our strategy overview, uh, just briefly, um, we do hard money lending. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, I'm going to let uh, David talk a little bit about uh, what hard money lending is, why hard money lending exists, uh, and some of what we're seeing there. Yeah, so my, my background comes from lending for commercial banks and in the, specifically in the commercial assets. And one of the things I, I found at, at the previous bank that I worked for was lending uh, lines of credit to uh, hard money lenders. And it was, it, was quite, it was quite fun to be able to lend on that and, and start to convince others of what, what that meant. Uh, but, but overall we're lending, we lend specifically on fix and flips assets. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at the collateral. We're looking at single family homes and it's just a, we're looking for quick, buy the property, fix it up, turn around and sell it. And in the end, these are, these are qualified borrowers. They're, they're borrowers with a lot of money uh, and they're just looking to leverage that asset and be able to have someone that can come through and close quick. Some of them are looking for having us come in as a lender because they want advice and they want someone that's looking at a lot of assets. You know, at, at any time we have over 300 loans on the books. And because of that, we, we have a good pulse on, on the market and what's going on in the market. And so, uh, people rely on us to be able to be involved, uh, but we, in in the end, banks can't lend on this on this asset class because it's they're all about cash flow, and so it's it may be a great loan for a bank to come in on, but it it doesn't work for the cash flow, and then two, it's in and out, and so you've got to be nimble, you've got to be able to close quickly, uh, not meet all the regulations that are out there, and so it, it's a it's a quality product, and in the end how we do it is we really do it as a relationship and we really want to know who, who those borrowers are. Um, you know, for, for instance, we get, we get to know these borrowers really well and, and we love when they call in and tell us how things are going. Uh, one of our borrowers recently, they bought a house and they fixed it up. And at the end, when they were about to put it on the market, uh, they called and said, Hey, I'm out of money, but I, but I'd like to raise the, the ceiling in the, in the great room and the entrance. And I think that will make it sell much quicker. And so we went and looked at it, walked the property with them. We found that it would $6,000 would raise that ceiling and realtors all agreed that it would just make the product sell quick. And so uh, we made that increase in the loan and very quickly that property was gone and we, and we were on to the next asset. And so the relationship matters more than anything to us um, on these fix and flips. And really, that's a little bit about the underwriting, a little bit about uh, what we do there. It, the, the, we do it different. I think a lot of different people are going to look at uh, underwriting and they think, you know, once underwriting is done, you know, the loan is done. A good loan in a portfolio and you're done. We look at it as three different pieces, uh, not only the underwriting, but also the positioning and the servicing. Positioning, uh, we can talk all sorts. Uh, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about how the fund is currently structured. Uh, as far as where we were taking on exposure. But for example, um, the first thing that uh, when, when we lend money to somebody, the first thing they do with our asset that we've collateralized, the first thing that they do is they start destroying the asset that we have as collateral. They start ripping down walls, they start um, uh, discovering new problems, all of those sorts of things. And we talk about 
the loan going through a J curve. So it starts uh, on the left, it kind of starts with a certain valuation. It then goes down in value before the value accretes. And the reason that's important from a positioning point of view is if you only have a single asset uh, or you have all of your portfolio all, you know, all originated at one point, it's gonna go down that curve and your entire portfolio is gonna be subject to the bottoming out of that J curve. So that's just one way we think about the positioning. We also are very careful as far as the mix of size, as far as the geographical mix, um, as far as the concentration to a single borrower, um, as far as uh, all of those sorts of things, the concentration by type. So all of those things build into positioning a portfolio. Um, and then the other piece of it is servicing. Part of the reason that uh, there are so many of our competitors that no longer exist, there's really kind of two reasons that um, about a third of the capacity of our uh, um, industry has been taken out. And that's for two reasons. One of the reasons is, is servicing. Most or many people, what they do uh, is they, um, they're, they're all about origination. Once it's originated, they give it to somebody else to service. Then they lose track of the customer. That's important for two reasons. Number one, you're not going to get the repeat business or your subject, you know, you've got some breakage there. And number two, you can't tell what's going on. So when, um, when things start to go south, you know, and, and some percentage of your portfolio uh, is going to go, is going to become problematic. Um, and you want to know what's on top of it. So we know, you know, we have the opportunity, like David said, to uh, lend additional money. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but you've also got things that go bad. Then we know all of the, you know, what's going on with the portfolio, what's going on with all of those other sorts of things so we can keep track of it. Um, also, um, you know, we make the decisions in the servicing process, which is important. And that's, if you want to give me the next slide. There you go. So all of these, these are the things that go into the underwriting. You want to give me the next slide. There you go. Positioning, uh, all of those sorts of things we share. And you want to give me the next slide. And servicing. And, real, and then go ahead and give me the next slide. Um, and David can talk about a couple of the representative transactions. Yeah, so this, this represents uh, a lot of what, we're work, what we work on on a daily. Uh, some of the properties as, a, as the first one, it's just a quick rehab. It's something they buy, they put lipstick on and, and turn around and sell. This, this was happening several years back. This was at the around 2012, 2013. As things have continued to progress, uh, the rehabs become more. And so there's, there's houses that they're needing to do an addition. They're needing to pop the top. They're needing to pop the side, uh, put a lot of money into the houses. And so uh, that continues to evolve. But in the end, they're putting money into them. They're usually right now, it, you know, there's about a 15 to 18% margin that that's in the house once they purchase it, fix it up and turn around and sell it. And, you know, if it's much less, then we start having a discussion with them that why are they, why are they into this house and make sure that they understand that the profitability is not there. In, in the end, our goal is that the borrower makes more money than us on each deal. And then when we're, when we're done, they'll go on and do another one. And that's where we become more profitable is continuing. And, and obviously we're at less risk being a, a deed of trust on that property. If you want to give us the next slide. And this is just, this is a great home that uh, once again, higher end rehab, what it takes to get through that. You can see that, you know, it's, it's a full, full exterior redo. The roof was redone and that, but inside they really took it to another level and this is, this is what we love about this business is we're improving communities. This house was in fairly rough shape and you know, it would have been hard to have a family buy this house, fix it up themselves. Uh, families don't typically have the down payment to fix it, put it down, fix up the house and still be in there. So this gives them the opportunity to buy a house completely done in the area they want to be in, the school district they want to be in and, um, and be comfortable with what it is. And really that's what we're seeing. You know, the um, people want a home that is move-in condition. Uh, they don't want to, the, these 
new builds are, ge are generally about 40 minutes away from the work locus. So that's not really working out. And a lot of them are not compliant. It's not just the aesthetics. This one's a beautiful before and after, but it's not just the aesthetics. It's the AC, it's the, well, you know, which is clearly important here in Arizona, but it's all the HVAC, all of those sorts of things. It's, you know, the Google Home. Um, if a, a project like this one, the before and after, you know, it's a 1950s, 60s uh, build. Um, it's, there's a number of things that it needs to just be uh, caught up on. And, and some of those are code. Uh, next slide. So as we talked about, um, the majority of our exposure, this just shows uh, where we are. The majority of our exposure uh, is Arizona, Colorado, and Texas. You can see Texas getting a little bit darker. It's been getting darker and darker as we go. About 80% of our uh, portfolio is spread out between Arizona, Colorado, and Texas. Uh, right now, we are in a total of 22 states. So we're in some of those other states. We obviously have a huge um, uh, preference for non-judicial states uh, and uh, the states that you see that you're in and you're like, wait, they're in a couple judicial states. Those are where we've cross collateralized. So we've got some other assets that are uh, um, with that same borrower that allow us to grab those. Uh, next slide. And we've been doing this a long time. So we've done a whole, but this is just Arizona or just the Phoenix metropolitan area. We've done, you know, almost 3,000 homes uh, just in the Phoenix area. So we're, we, we know the area and that's how we like to work. Uh, we are a relationship-based borrower or re, uh, relationship-based lender. And uh, so, you know, we know the areas, we know the borrowers, we know how we get a hold of them. Um, a number of our other, you know, competitors, uh, they're buying um, leads off of the internet and those sorts of things. They don't have that direct face-to-face -face contact. And this is really one of our differentiators. Um, go ahead and give me the next slide. So really what I wanted to talk a little bit about here uh, is the, uh, the fund uh, and some of the advantages of using a fund. So we are structured uh, as, a, uh, as a REIT uh, that does two important things for you on the REIT side. You get some sort of tax benefit. Um, you also get, um, uh, we do all the paperwork for you. And so you get, the, you get the benefit of that blocker. So you're gonna end up with a K1, you're gonna end up with line five uh, um, distributions. Uh, and the way that we do that uh, is we've got, the, we've got a one year lockup. And then after that, uh, you know, quarterly or even monthly distributions if you want it. Um, the other advantage of doing a fund like this is we avoid some of the other models, uh, the co-investment models, um, uh, the co-investment model uh, or, you know, the syndicated loans or the P2P, those are super problematic uh, in my opinion or in our opinion in this world. When something goes wrong and, you know, you're going to end up with, uh, you know, one, per, one or 2% that go wrong. We have the right to, we drive the bus, we make the decisions, we proceed with the foreclosure, we bear the expenses of legal, those sorts of things. Um, so, and the question came into how did we seed the fund? Uh, it, it's, it's our money. Um, uh, BCP insiders are the single largest group of investors in the fund. We're 15 plus percent of the fund. Um, uh, and then, you know, we've got friends and family. We've got some institutions in there. Uh, we've got uh, some of our uh, ex lenders in our fund that appreciate the fact that we're doing all the paperwork uh, and we're always fully deployed it's really important for them. Uh, you know, some of the other people um, can do these loans and they look at it and go, wow, you know, these loans are, you know, yielding 10 or 12%. I can do those on my own. And then I can keep all of the uh, returns for myself. That's true. But then when that loan rolls off in six months, you got to find another one and your money isn't, isn't working for, you know, two or three months or however long it is. And that really eats into your yields. Um, so that's a little bit about the funds um, and we use just a little bit of leverage so we don't run out of money. Um, the, another question coming in, the range is percentage of uh, expected returns. If you go to the next slide, I think that's where we get to this one even. Yeah, so this is our, this is our fund return. You can see some of our volatility. So, um, and those sorts of things, which is not very much. Um, the orange line is our returns versus the S&P. 
Am I sure that, you know, really we should be doing our returns, you know, versus the S&P? You know, I don't really know. That's the way Prequin does it. Um, you can see, you know, you can go calculate your own Sharpe ratio or whatever you want off, off of our fund returns. We're just not very volatile. We try real hard, um, not a great marketing term to use, but we try real hard to be boring. Um, so hopefully that, uh, so that answers some of that. And if I can just interject, um, with, with our fund, with our returns to our investors, um, our, our competitors, I don't think are, are as such high, as high of returns. We do focus, so two things. One, on the lending side, we do focus on trying to uh, earn a little bit more and we put our fees into the fund. And so most lenders out there are, the lender collects the fee, that's how they pay themselves. But we, everything comes through our management fee. That's how we pay our employees. That's how we pay the lenders that are out in the field trying to find deals. Uh, and so, you know, other, other funds out there are paying quite a bit less than this. I would say, you know, somewhere between six and 10% is, is kind of the range out there. Yeah, and there's a, there's a variety of reasons for that. One of the reasons is, is generally they keep the um, uh, origination fees. We do not do that. It goes into the fund. Um, the other reason is, is, you know, they do states that we don't do. So California is a big state. We don't like California. California, the yields are compressed there. Um, we avoid it. You know, that's a good reason to avoid it. But the real reason we avoid it is uh, to, to take anything back. It's going to be 270 days. We don't do Nevada. We don't do New Mexico. We don't do some of those other ones that get problematic. And then, you know, of course, we try to stay away uh, from the judicial states. As far as our expected returns, we're in the 10 to 12 percent range. Uh, that's an annualized if you keep it in the fund, but that's uh, pretty much where we are. Um, what levels of insurance do we carry, including DNO? So all of our uh, borrowers have to, uh, it's fully insured, we're a named, uh, and then of course we have DNO uh, on, the, on the fund uh, as well. Um, I can get you that exact number, I don't remember what it is, but the lawyers and accountants that review it what, think it's plenty. What comes into play, obviously, the most is what the insurance is on the property. That's that's where the real risk is, is in each property. So uh, it's it's a balancing act to manage and verify that properties all have the right insurance on them. Um, also that you're checking that the flood insurance, whether a property needs flood insurance and that if it does, that it has it. And so uh, insurance is definitely something that's needed. Uh, what, you know, there's always the bad side too. We, we had one where it went into foreclosure and uh, they, they stopped paying their insurance. And we sadly, just in those couple of weeks where we didn't get uh, forced place insurance on the property, uh, the basement flooded. And that was about $18,000 worth of tearing out walls and made the value of the property go down. And so uh, it means it's, it's very important to be on top of the insurance and make sure that you're covered. Yeah, and kind of, so where are we seeing, you know, going forward, what are we seeing going forward? Um, you know, you can see the Wall Street Journal, those sorts of people saying houses prices are actually rising through the pandemic. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing. We're just not seeing the, the decreases in prices. Um, that's a function of two things, right? It's, it's supply and demand. So you've got a little bit of demand uh, accretion uh, and that's, from, you know, people wanting to move out of urban, people wanting to move out of multifamily residential, people wanting to, you know, being in the single family, you've got the millennials buying, which, you know, we talked about a year or so ago and, you know, kind of got laughed at, but, you know, now they are coming. And there's a lot of money on the sidelines, Prequin noted that uh, this morning. Um, and then the other side is, is people just aren't listing as much. So, you know, you've got a decreased supply against a uh, constant or you know a, a decreased demand we can call that even with those positives a net net decrease so you got to be really careful um, when you're talking about volumes versus prices so volumes are definitely down and that's a function of uh you know the supply as well but the prices really aren't off that much i would also caution that real estate uh, are lagging assets so even today we're hearing a number of people saying well we're not seeing it yet and you know, oh, you know, you know, whoo, we made it through. Mm, it's not going to work that way, or we don't think it's going to be worked that way. Real estate is a lagging asset. It's very uneven. If you look at the last downturn, um, you know, theoretically, according to Case Shiller, the bottom was January of 2009. 
but Atlanta didn't didn't bottom until December of 2011, and San Diego was the first out, and they already came out. They came out at um, in February of 2008. In 2008, and really, what's going to happen? Those troubled assets. There are troubled assets. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, about 30% of the capacity in our industry has come out. That's some of the big guys, some of the names uh, that you would know if you have traffic in the space. Um, Pier Street and Turak and uh, some of those guys, they're not back to market. They say they are, but, um, you know, for example, Pier Street is back with a 12-month interest rate reserve. That's not a commercial product. So the, with the secondary market dead, a bunch of those assets were, will come back. A number of those people that were dealing in the secondary market already going into this were having about 10% of their book troubled. Uh, those assets are all going to end up owned and uh, owned by the, the lender and they'll find their way to the market. So, and then public REITs and the secondary, and public REITs are also um, selling off, uh, having some problems. So, but those are some of the things that, that we see going forward. Overall, we think our return stream is going to be about as boring as, as has been, uh, you know, 10 to 12% annualized return, including the REIT, um, those sorts of things. And I'll go ahead and take, um, there's two questions that I'm going to lump together here. So and, and we kind of discuss anticipated impact of COVID-19 just based on what the reports are out there. But I'm going to talk a little bit about real estate that we're seeing. And then um, there's another question about uh, what most recent deals that we've done and loan to values and loan to cost that those have been. So uh, with, with COVID, it, it's been, the, the question's been out there, you know, what should we be lending on and how should we be lending? Well, the good news is, um, we've been able to be much pickier with what's come through. There's been a lot of lenders who have, you know, slowed down their lending, whereas we've been able to continue to see what's out there and be able to choose which loans we do. Uh, one of the things, our, our current portfolio, we limit our loan to values, which is the after repair value. So when it's all complete, the number we rely on is what it's, what the value is at completion. We have, always stayed under 70 percent and that's been our that's been our benchmark uh, and then we we care a lot about the loan to cost whereas i think a lot of the other funds that i run into don't don't care as much about the how much money they have into the deal but we want the skin in the game so we we limit it to 85 percent of cost now those two numbers in general end up coming out about even or have always come out about even they've been pretty close however over the past past couple of weeks if we've, as we've been lending, uh, most of the deals we've been doing have had an ARV of after, after repair value of around 450,000, probably on average. So right in that, ba that family moving into a house, maybe a little bit nicer home, has a good income. And, um, and so that's, that's the after repair value. Now, the, the great thing is because of loan to cost and that we lend on that, they are buying them at a little bit of a discount. And so our loan to vet, being at 85% loan to cost, we have ended up being about just under 65% of value on average. And so, so our portfolio in general has become a little bit, uh, a little bit better, if, if I can say that comment. And then uh, the other thing is actually during all this, we've had some great borrowers that went to other lenders that have popped up and that have a lot of money to put down. And we've actually done a couple of deals around 50 to 60% of cost, where they just, all they're doing is leveraging up their assets and they wanna be more protected and don't wanna be over leveraged at this time. So uh, the deals are still coming in. We're just being picky on what, what it is and what we're, what we're putting into the portfolio. We have another question uh, from a friend, what, or from someone asking for a friend, what would you say it would cost to start a similar structured fund not in our backyard. Thank you for not in our backyard. Um, this is a really big uh, market, by the way. So there is room for others. We're friendly with a number of other uh, lenders um, that, uh, you know, if, if it doesn't fit for us, we, we refer all of our um, uh, California stuff to, to two lenders there. There's a bunch of stuff on the East Coast that we don't do that we uh, give to other lenders. We like to see more broadly. We're a member of AAPL, the American Association of Private Lenders. I'm on the Forbes Real Estate Council. You know, so we, we trade information. Um, so to set up a fund like this probably costs right now in the neighborhood of $150,000. 
uh, you need to get the, um, the docks set up. The REIT structure is more expensive than you'd think it, it frustratingly, it's more expensive uh, to set up than you'd think it was. And then of course you need all the infrastructure. We have um, just over a dozen people here um, that work on this fund. So um, that's kind of the neighborhood to, 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 to run one of this size. Yeah, and that, you know, being out in the field lending, uh, every event you go to, there's a bunch of hard money lenders that show up. And the, every month, it's someone new uh, that started up, started their fund, or you know, it's a, an indiv individual with with his own money that shows up. And we keep very close to them because they'll they're, the frustrations come, and um, we love to be there to help them at that point and either you know purchase some of the assets that they've done or take over the, the funds that they're managing at that time. Couple other questions. Um, do we do seconds? No, so we don't do junior loans. We are always in a first position. We require personal guarantee, so we don't do those. We don't do multifamily in California. Do we do audited financials? Thank you, I skipped that one. Absolutely, um, our uh, auditor is Armanino. We've done that for the past, since, this, uh, since we've been around with this one. So if we can share those with you and that's fruitful, we're happy to share those. Uh, with you. Um, another question, uh, uh, what do we do about, uh, it, it, can, can you walk us through a couple uh, of the, of the de defaults or foreclosures? So go ahead. Yeah, no. Um, we have those, yep. We, we do. It, there, you, can't, you can't lend on, lend on real estate without uh, default coming. And so we're, we, we are very fortunate. Our default is around 1%. And so they do come and on a portfolio of over 300 loans, it, they happen. And so, you know, in general, the most typical default is very clean for us. We, we either foreclose on the property or it sells before the foreclosure ever happens. We start foreclosure right at 30 days. We get through it as quick as we possibly can. And in the end, um, most of the properties we take back, we hand them over to a wholesaler and they are sold and we, we, we don't lose any money on them. Now there's that unfortunate case of where something comes up. And um, for instance, we have, we have one right now that, that sold yesterday and it was a property that the borrower, the borrower just ran out of money and they, they had tried to hand it back to us, but right before they handed it back to us, they filed bankruptcy per someone's guidance. And that messed, messed things up a little bit. We were actually already under contract uh, with the, well, not planning to lose any money uh, because of the bankruptcy. It took us a few months to get it out of the bankruptcy. By that time, we finally were able to put it on the market. We, we, we gave it to a wholesaler. They put it on the market and we just had a very minimal loss. And when I say loss, that's a loss to interest. That is not a loss to principal. Um, over, that, over the course of that time, we, we made about 90,000 in interest on that property. And we were we had to give up about twenty five thousand of that, and that's that's one where you know everything played against us, um, and it it was one actually in the J curve where we actually the property had been started start the rehab had started but it wasn't complete, and so the value of it was not at the highest point, which we could have fixed it up and finished it and tried to market it at that point, but we've got to make those decisions each time. Couple other questions. Do we use outside appraisals? Yes, uh, about 75% of the fund. We don't, some of them we don't, we don't need it. It's, it's too quickly, but we use outside appraisals. It's about 75% of the fund. Our valuation versus the other valuation uh, is about 6% off. How levered is the fund? We're about 1.3 times right now, meaning that for every dollar worth of equity that we've taken, we use about 30%. Uh, um, from, uh, and that's a dedicated line. That's not a secondary line. Uh, so, um, so with that, we're going to run out of time. We appreciate that. Any other questions? We're happy to, uh, we're, we'd love to reach out and talk to you guys about that. Uh, and we can do that through fly or you can reach out through us, uh, reach out to us directly. Uh, Rob, thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing, going through the presentation today. It was very interesting and, and informative. Um, we would love to um, invite the people on the call today to check out the marketplace listing for Boomerang Capital. Uh, you can find it at marketplace.flyer.org. 
Um, I will be sending out a follow-up uh, of this presentation uh, for you to, to watch and to also um, look at the uh, slides uh, inside of the presentation today. Uh, so please st stay tuned for that. I know we had a lot of requests for it. And uh, in, in that follow-up will be, um, you know, the way to, to follow up directly with Rob and his team, or if you want to ask us a question, and then you'll also have a, a, a listing, uh, a link to his listing on our marketplace. Um, Rob, thanks for the presentation today. And, you know, we, we wish you guys at Boomerang Capital the best, and we appreciate uh, you being a part of the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to just go through really quickly